we heard this morning from Russell where he mentioned the leopard-like beast in Revelation 13 and uh, yesterday or the day before, in the recent past, I was listening to Junior um, share with me how he understood the composite beast of Revelation 13. And I, w- I want to say here at the outset that I truly believe that prophecy has more than one level of truth. So I'm approaching Revelation 13 here from the outset, not in opposition to some of the understandings about what the beast, the first beast in Revelation 13 represents. But what I'm going to try to emphasize is the historical position of John and the history of the transition from papal to pagan Rome, um, but not to try to deny or oppose some of the other truths that are in these verses, but to make a point about the image of the beast in Revelation 13. So let's begin, if you will, uh, with the first four verses of Revelation 13. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the names of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? In connection with what I was just saying, we've looked at this passage um, several times. The dragon primarily represents Satan, but in a secondary sense, it's a symbol of Rome. And of course, I've looked at that for the purpose of saying that there are a couple levels or beyond in Bible prophecy, but in this passage, Revelation 13, this directly has impact on what we're looking at. Sister White here is commenting on the dragon of Revelation 12, and certainly Revelation 12 and 13 must be understood together. It's uh, describing the history Um, from pagan Rome in the time period when they were going to persecute Christ as a child, and it moves into the history of papal Rome, the fifth kingdom of Bible prophecy, and onward to the lamb-like beast of the United States, the sixth kingdom of Bible prophecy. So when Sister White's defining the dragon here for us as Satan, but in a secondary sense, pagan Rome, this is the passage where this certainly fits. And what I want to do here is... Um, try to emphasize that um, John is on the sands of the seas between two entities, the sea beast and the earth beast, and the place where the earth and sea meet is on the seashore. John is in the middle of these two beasts, and uh, inspiration purposely tells us that this is where he's at, so inspiration is trying to tell us what to consider what it means that John is in between the sea beast and the earth beast. And for me, we've quoted it in the prophecy school already. I like the way James White states um, very simply that prophecy is history in advance. Uh, Prophecy and history, you can't separate them. And I would suggest to you that when we see John on the sand of the sea between an earth beast and a sea beast, that primarily it's saying that John is in the history when he receives this vision between the sea beast and the earth beast, but there are primary and secondary understandings. I'm simply going to take up this historical understanding. So if we break up um, the composite beast here, we see that uh, John is located on the sand of the sea, and he sees a beast coming up out of the sea. And I'm breaking up this beast into seven heads, and then ten horns and with ten crowns upon the heads, the names of blasphemy. And the beast is like unto a leopard. Uh, Russell was dealing with that this morning. But his feet were like the feet of the bear, and he had a mouth as the mouth of a lion. So I've broken these, dis- these characteristics of the beast up. Um, in order to make a historical point, when John is standing on the sea between two beasts, 
And if we identify that the purpose of placing John on the seashore between these two beasts, that he's being placed in history, that I would suggest to you that when he looks backwards into history and he sees this beast, the characteristics that he sees upon this beast are characteristics that move backwards into history. And, and uh, so, Daniel 7, 3, I saw four great beasts, and four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse from one another, having seven heads and a little horn, before whom, th before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up, and ten horns, it was di diverse, and it had ten horns, like unto a leopard, another like a leopard, a bear, a second like unto a bear, a lion, the first was like a lion. You see these kingdoms of Bible prophecy in the book of Daniel broken up historically, historically. When John sees this beast in Revelation 13 at the beginning and he looks back, the first thing that he sees is seven heads. Now, there, to me, there is... A, a great deal of light in the seven heads and the ten horns and all of these beasts. Please let me emphasize, I'm not saying this is it. I'm just dealing with the history. The seven European he heads, what they symbolize, what they represent, a uh, wealth of information there. But I'm saying the first thing that he sees as he looks back are the seven heads. And the next thing that he sees are the manifestation of pagan Rome before the seven heads, which was the ten horns of pagan Rome. The next thing that he sees is the leopard of Grecia. The next thing that he sees is the bear of Medo-Persia. The next thing that he sees is the lion of Babylon. One of the things that's being conveyed here is John is standing at a certain point in history and he's looking backwards into history this way to Babylon and the kingdoms that have come after Babylon. And if he turns and looks this way, then he's going to see another beast coming up out of the heaven. The dates for these, um, the seven heads, uh, that, have, that the little head came up in the midst of these seven heads, um, 538 is uh, an acceptable date for when uh, the papacy took control of the world. The, the ten horns began to be disintegrated in 330, uh, the leopard 31 BC, the bear 538, the lion 605, standard, traditional, Adventist understanding of when these kingdoms um, arrive in history. Then he turns and looks the other way, and it says the next to come on stage, a little title, that's what Sister White's going to say here. Spalding again, page one. I'm submitting to you that um, very easy in the spirit of prophecy to see that this first beast in Revelation 13 is the papacy. Very easy in the spirit of prophecy that, to see that the second beast is the United States. Uh, but I want to emphasize that because in Adventism today, um, there's, a, there's arguments that uh, the beast that follows the papal beast is atheism, and that isn't what inspiration identifies. I saw the two-horned beast had a dragon's mouth and that power was in his head and that the decree would go out of his mouth. Then I saw the mother of harlots, that the mother was not the daughters, but separate and distinct from them. Who's the mother? The papacy. Babylon, Revelation 17, mystery, Babylon, the mother of harlots. And the daughters are different. She has had her day, and it is in the past. And her daughters, the Protestant sects, were the next to come on the stage and act out the same mind that the mother had when she persecuted the saints. I saw that as the mother had been declining in power, the daughters had been growing, and soon they will exercise the power once exercised by the mother. The kingdom of Bible prophecy that comes after uh, the papacy in history is the, the land beast. Great controversy, 440. What nation of the new world was in 1798 rising into power, giving promise of strength and greatness and attracting the attention of the world? The application of the symbol admits of no question. One nation, and only one, meets the specifications of this prophecy. It points unmistakably to the United States of America. From my personal study a long time ago, I haven't studied this for years, but I'm sure all of you reached a point in your study in Adventism when you decided you needed to come to grips with Jones and Wagner and the 1888 message and 
That happened for me years ago. Not that I, I'm opposed to studying it again. I just don't have the time to do much of what I want to do anymore. But when I used to do that, one of the conclusions that I personally drew about what went on in, in 1888 is that the primary, not necessarily the primary, but one of the primary reasons that God's people would not receive the message of 1888 was a unwillingness to surrender preconceived ideas. And I believe you've run into that over and over again in Bible prophecy. And brothers and sisters, there's many of us in Adventism today that we've got a preconceived idea about who the sixth kingdom in Bible prophecy is, particularly when we're dealing with Revelation 17 where it says five have fallen and one is. And we're treading on inspiration here that is teaching us that the kingdom of Bible prophecy that follows the papacy is the United States. And it's amazing to me that we can't see it because it's real simple. Revelation 13 is all you really need. The kingdom that comes after the papacy is the United States. But here we're looking at the spirit of prophecy echoing that truth. Signs of the Times, February 8, 1910. At the time when the papacy, robbed of its strength, was forced to desist from persecution, John beheld a new power coming up to echo the dragon's voice and carry forward the same cruel and blasphemous work. This power, the last that is to wage war against the church and the law of God, is represented by a beast with lamb-like horns. The beast preceding it had risen from the sea, but this one came up out of the earth, representing the peaceful rise of the nation which it symbolized, the United States. The power in Bible prophecy that follows the papacy is the United States. Going, dropping back into some of the characteristics, uh, there's a purpose for this that's a little bit outside of what I want to deal with here in Revelation 13. But if we, if we drop back into verse 5 of Revelation 13 now and look at one of the characteristics of the papal power, it says, And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given him to continue forty-two months. The brethren in Adventism that seek to reapply the time prophecies, particularly of Daniel 12, the 1290, the 1260, and the 1335 of Daniel 12, they seek to apply these time prophecies at the end of the world in a day-for-day -day fashion, typically. They also latch on to verse 5 of Revelation 13 and insist that because the previous verses to 5 state, let's read it so you can see it, in verse 3 it says, and I saw one of his heads as it were wounded death, and his deadly wound is healed. The argument is, as verse 3 is saying that here is the healing of the deadly wound, and therefore verse 5 comes after verse 3, and therefore verse 5 is teaching that after the deadly wound is healed, that the papacy will rule the world for literally 42 months. Um, they're, they're insisting to hold on to the sequence there when in reality um, these are the characteristics of the papacy. This passage is not establishing a sequence that denies the other truths of the Word of God. And the, the other truth of the Word of God is that in Revelation 17, the angel comes down and says what? Time shall be no longer. But because we're in this passage, I want to make this point. It's not really the point of this. Okay, what did I say? Five? Seventeen, yeah, ten. Revelation 10. But notice this in the Great Controversy. This is one of at least seven places, at least seven different places, there may be more, where Sister White teaches this. The period here mentioned, 42 months, and 1,203 score days are the same, alike representing the time in which the Church of Christ was to suffer oppression from Rome. The 1,260 years of papal supremacy began in 538 and would therefore terminate in 1798. Inspiration tells us this 42 months of verse 5 is the Dark Ages. And there's at least seven places where Sister White comments on verse 5 and says it's the Dark Ages. So let that be in the record. Um, those that want to continue with that preconceived idea are fighting against the Lord. So I want to pick up some of the characteristics of this first beast um, as we are walking our way towards Revelation 17. Here are some of the characteristics out of uh, the first 10 verses of Revelation 13, which are verses that are dealing with the papal power. 
It says, And all the world wondered after the beast, and they that worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they that worshipped the beasts. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And the point is this. The papal beast is the beast that the whole world wonders after. It's the, the beast the whole world is going to worship. And the whole world, you can summarize, that does wonder after and worship the beast. You can put them in the category of those whose names aren't written in the Lamb's book of life. Now remember that characteristic, because when we get into Revelation 17, it'll be helpful as we walk through that chapter. Verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And we've been through this passage, um, I don't know how many times, a few times in this prophecy school for the speaking of a nation is the action of his legislative and judicial authorities. I hope everyone now has that little short little sentence memorized um, because in Revelation 13, 11, that's when the United States speaks as a dragon. Um, so what does that mean? It means at least two things prophetically. When the leading churches of the United States united up upon a Upon such points of doctrine as are held by them in common shall influence the state to enforce their decrees and sustain their institutions, then Protestant America will have formed an image of the Roman hierarchy and the infliction of civil penalties upon dissenters will inevitably result. The image, of, the image to the beast represents that form of apostate Protestantism which will be developed when the Protestant churches shall seek the aid of the civil power for the enforcement of their dogmas. The mark of the beast still remains to be defined. Now notice, Sister White is clearly making a distinction between the image and the mark of the beast. And the image of the beast is when the Protestant churches are going to use civil power to enforce their religious dogmas. But we're not done with defining this. Great Controversy 448, a few pages after that. The enforcement of Sunday keeping on the part of the Protestant churches is an enforcement of the worship of the papacy of the beast. Those who, understanding the claims of the fourth commandment, choose to observe the false instead of the true Sabbath are thereby, thereby paying homage to that power by which alone it is commanded. Now notice this, please. But in the very act of enforcing a religious duty by a secular power, the churches would themselves form an image to the beast. Hence, the enforcement of Sunday keeping in the United States would be an enforcement of the worship of the beast and his image. And my point is this. If we read this carefully, in the act, the act, the action of Protestant America of enforcing the Sunday law, through the civil government, that's what it's saying. In that very act, the churches have formed the image of the beast. It's reached its full maturity at the point when the Sunday law is passed. That's what it's saying. And, and in Revelation 13, 11, when the United States speaks as a dragon, the image of the beast has been formed in the United States fully, and the mark of the beast is being enforced. Someone asked me here, uh, um, and, I, and you get this question from time to time, that's why I'm trying to dredge it up, and I don't remember the exact words, but basically they were saying, does, does probation close when the Sunday law is passed or when the Sunday law is enforced? So I want to remind us uh, of the, the definition that we set out early on in this prophecy school. The Sunday law that we're speaking about is twofold. And it's when you're forced to observe Sunday and persecuted for keeping Sabbath. And to me, that question is, is you know, not very direct. So what I'm saying is, it's saying, I guess, when it's enforced. And uh, if there is a time period between when it's passed and it's enforced, and with some laws in the United States, that is the case. Uh, in fact, I think probably most laws in the United States, when they pass them, um, they put a date on them when they are enforceable. But uh, what we're talking about is when that law 
persecutes you for keeping Sabbath and forces you to observe Sunday. When that happens, the, the Protestants of the United States will have formed an image of the beast and the mark of the beast will arrive in history in the United States. So when the United States speaks, two things happen simultaneously in the United States. The whole story of Bible prophecy is woven around the combination of church and state. We mentioned uh, yesterday, at some point in time when we were dealing with the book of Daniel, I believe, that in the book of Daniel, Daniel uses the word continual, which is translated as daily, to represent the pagan desolating power. Paganism. That's what the daily, continual, represents in Daniel. But in Daniel 9 and 26, it tells us that there are desolations determined. There are two desolating powers that Daniel deals with in the book of Daniel. Paganism. Pagan Rome is the first desolating power. Paganism in general, if you, if you can be very accurate to Daniel's usage of daily and realize that paganism from the time of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and pagan Rome is the desolating power there. That's in general paganism. Specifically, in some of the verses, it's dealing with the history when pagan Rome was that desolating power, but it was still paganism. That's the first desolating power. It's always in association, in the book of Daniel, with the papal desolating power. But in the book of Daniel, in chapter 8, the papal desolating power is called the transgression of desolation. But in chapters 11 and 12, the papal desolating power is called the abomination that maketh desolate. It's the same identical power, but Daniel is teaching us two things about that power. And where Daniel in chapter 11 and 12 is identifying the papacy in terms of abomination that maketh desolate, Abomination, just take your dictionary, deals with idolatry. And the mark of Rome's um, idolatry, the mark of its authority, is what Sister White calls the idol Sabbath, I-D-O-L, not I-D-L-E, the idol Sabbath, which is Sunday. And the abomination that maketh desolate is symbolizing the papal power, but primarily it's emphasizing the mark of Rome's authority, Sunday observance. But in Daniel chapter 8, when Daniel speaks of the transgression of desolation, it's emphasizing papal authority, but it's emphasizing a different aspect of the papacy, and it's emphasizing the transgression that takes place that allows the papacy to operate. And in the verses where that's dealt with in Daniel 8, it's identifying the combination of church and state that began with Clovis in 496, the transgression that began uh, the, the placing the papacy on the throne of the earth was the combination of church and state. So what I'm saying to you is that when Daniel identifies the papal desolating power, he breaks it up into two parts. One symbolizes the mark of Rome's authority, Sunday observance, the other represents the combination of church and state. Or, if you're going to put it in the terminology of John the Revelator, and these two books go together, one represents the mark of the beast, and one represents the image of the beast. And both these things arrive in history in the United States when the United States speaks as a dragon. And the image of the beast, simplified down in terms of a definition, is the combination of church and state with one thing that needs to be added to it. It's the combination of church and state with the church in control of that relationship. And of course, that's what the story of Elijah, Elijah the first and the second teaches us. Jezebel was the, the controlling power over Ahab. Herodias was the one that was controlling Herod. It's this unlawful relationship but not simply the unlawful relationship. It also includes that the woman is the one in ascendancy. But the combination of church and state runs through Bible prophecy. And when it comes to Daniel chapter 2, um, we must factor in, we should factor in, 
And you should go back if you haven't done this um, and read the pioneers. I mean, some of it, we, when my daughter started helping put in, putting our newsletter together, we were traveling. I don't remember where we were traveling, but she did an, uh, a newsletter here recently where I said, go ahead, you know, put it together. And uh, she came across an article um, before 1844 by William Miller. And some of the things that William Miller was saying, we just wouldn't accept today. But, was, but what was excellent about that article is you could see his reasoning. And it was, it was excellent. But you could also see that his reasoning was based upon the fact that he believed all Bible prophecy was going to conclude in 1843 and then, then later in 1844. That's where the pioneers would, were. As sound as they were, they truly believed that Bible prophecy came to a conclusion in 1844. So as they approached Bible prophecy with what? A preconceived idea that was incorrect. They were forced to make these prophecies come to a conclusion um, when they thought the world was going to be destroyed. And so when you read the pioneers and you find them teaching that Daniel 2, the ten toes, is um, the ten toes of pagan Rome, uh, that's consistent with what was going on in their mind because they believed they were at the end of the world and there wasn't, that, there wasn't anything beyond that time period. But in uh, the theme in Bible prophecy, the combination of church and state, we have vantage ground to look back at that history and then re-examine Daniel 2, and it's really not challenging the pioneer position at all. The pioneers, if you read Uriah Smith, Uriah Smith's very strong to say that in Daniel chapter 2, the two shoulders, that's what represents the two powers of the Medes and the Persians. That kind of logic is the kind of logic that you would use to say that the two legs of iron represent two phases of Rome. I mean, his logic was there, but he, he, he clung to the pioneer position. He was unwilling to make that leap. But in Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 4, page 1168, it says, We have come, we have come to a time when God's sacred work is represented by the feet in the, of the image in which the iron was mixed with the miry clay. We've now come to that time. But statesmen will uphold the spurious Sabbath and will mingle their religious faith with the observance of this child of the papacy, placing it above the Sabbath which the Lord has sanctified and blessed, setting it apart for man to keep holy as a sign between him and his people to a thousand generations. The mingling of churchcraft and statecraft is represented by the iron and clay. Sister and White is teaching that the iron and clay in Daniel chapter 2 takes place at the end of the world, because believe it or not, the pioneer movement was at the end of the world. The only reason the pioneer movement is 150 years old now is because of our disobedience. God was willing to finish the prophetic testimony if he would have found an obedient people and it hasn't happened. That has to be factored into our study of prophecy. Sister White, when she penned this, knew that they'd come to the time, the end of the world, where suddenly the iron and clay represented what? The combination of church and state that takes place at the end of the world. And brothers and sisters, the ten toes of pagan Rome. When was the first of those ten toes uh, bowing to Rome in order to remove the other three that needed to be removed? 496. We're back, we're back in the 496 time period. So let's go to 495. 495, we know there was 10 horns, and, and there were still 10 horns beyond 496, but the process begins in 496 to remove the three horns. When are the three horns removed? 508. No, they're not. <laughs> the seven European kings have bowed to, to, to the papacy by 508, but the last of the three horns are removed in 538. So by the time we get to 538, those 10 horns are seven horns. And brothers and sisters, that's, what is that? That's 1,400 years before Sister White says, we have now come to the time where the iron and clay symbolizes the combination of church and state. And in, that, in the feet where the, the com, where the iron and clay is, there are ten toes, not seven toes. 
In Isaiah 14, 13 and 14, it says, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will also exalt my throne above the stars. Now, here's Lucifer is wanting to ascend, but he wants to exalt his throne, his political throne above the stars. He wants to, he wants to rule the political, I, I don't like calling it a political kingdom because there's no way, it's, it's, it's inappropriate in some ways to you know, apply politics to the Heavenly Father, but the civil jurisdiction of God here is identified by the throne and Satan wants to place his throne in that place and it says, I will set also upon the mount of the congregation. Satan wants to set on the civil throne and he wants to set in the church. The story of church and state begins right at the very beginning. Why? Because this is the, the breakdown of God's kingdom. His political authority and his um, right to deserve worship from his creation. In Psalm 80, 48, verses 1 and 2, it says, A song and psalm for the sons of Korah. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness. Beautiful for situation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. When Satan wants to sit on the sides of the north, he wants to sit in Jerusalem, in Zion. He wants to be ruling over God's church, along with sitting on God's throne. That was in heaven, coming down to the Tower of Babel, Genesis 11, 4 and 5. The first manifestation of Babylon, and in the first manifestation of Babylon, which we call Babel, we find all the characteristics that there will ever be of Babylon in Bible prophecy. But we're just taking two of them. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. They wanted to save themselves from a flood and they wanted to climb into heaven and be God. And let us make a name. What's a name? A character. And what was the character? That they could work their way to heaven. This is the religion of human nature. Lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower. They made two things which the children of men builded. Desire of Ages, 596, the tower was a symbol of the temple. Acts of the Apostle 58 continues that theme saying, in the scriptures the figure of the erection of the temple is frequently used to illustrate the building of a church. When Nimrod was building a temple, he was building a church. And then underneath that you'll see several quotes that identify a city as a geopolitical kingdom. Nimrod was building a kingdom by bringing together a combination of church and state. That's the, the th same thing that Lucifer co coveted to take control of the civil and the religious aspects of God's kingdom. He has Nimrod raise up a kingdom with those two aspects in it. This theme runs through Bible prophecy from the beginning to the end. Combination of church and state with the church in control of the arrangement. And we've read this. We've come to the time when God's sacred work is represented by the feet of the image in which the iron was mixed with miry clay. That's Daniel 2. Now, you do not need Sister White to give us a definition of what the iron and clay symbolizes. In Deuteronomy 28, verse 47, we're cutting into a very big passage where Moses is telling Israel the blessings that they will receive if they're obedient and the cursings they will receive if they're disobedient. And we're cutting in here just to see um, what the Lord told them would happen if they were disobedient, which they most certainly were. Verse 47, Therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies, which the Lord shall send against thee, in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness and in want of all things, and he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck until we have destroyed thee. The Lord shall bring a nation, so this is an iron nation, against thee from far, from the ends of the earth, as swift as an eagle flieth. By the way, one of the primary standards of Rome was an eagle. A nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. The, how do you say this? The language of Rome was a, a different, uh, what do you call that? When a language is a different 
foundation. What? Family? Is that? Anyway, the language in the Middle East that the Jews spoke was a different type of language than Roman, just like the English language is different than Chinese. Uh, dialect, there you go, there was the word. It's a totally different dialect. So this nation that was going to come and um, chastise Israel for their dis disobedience would be speaking a language that was different than uh, the Hebrew language. It would be a nation of fierce countenance, which shall not regard the person of the old, nor show, show favor to the young. And he shall besiege thee in all thy gates until thy high and fenced walls come down wherein thou hast trusted throughout all thy land, and he shall besiege thee in all thy gates throughout all thy land, which the Lord thy God hath given thee. The iron kingdom that brought judgment against Israel was Rome. It was the iron kingdom. It was a nation. The eagle was one of its main symbols. It spoke a different dialect, and it's identified as Scripture as the nation of fierce countenance. Daniel 2.40, and the fourth kingdom, Rome, shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and shall subdue all things, and as iron that breaketh all these things shall break in pieces and bruise. Daniel 8, 23 and 25, Russell referred to this for, for a different reason this morning. But in the latter time of their kingdom, the latter time of whose kingdom? Who was um, Russell dealing with this, this morning? The latter time of the Grecian kingdom, the last Syrian kings. When the transgressors are come to a full, a king of fierce countenance. Remember back here? It would be a nation of fierce countenance. And in Daniel chapter 8, it's a king of fierce countenance. And a king in Bible prophecy is what? A kingdom. A kingdom of fierce countenance. And understanding dark sentences. Have you ever been in a country... Um, where you do not understand the language. I have done so. And their sentences are dark. It's a different language. Um, uh, and it's understanding dark sentences shall stand up. And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. And he shall magnify himself in his heart and by peace destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes. But he shall be broken without hand. Rome is this country. Rome is the Iron Kingdom. Revelation 2, 26 and 27. And he that overcometh and keepeth my words unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Iron symbolizes civil authority. And as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. Now, he's, he's talking about civil authority ruling over the people and identifying civil authority with iron, but at the same time, he's identifying the people as vessels because we are earthen vessels which are made of clay and the relationship of us with God is symbolized by clay, but we're dealing with iron now. But in Revelation 12, 5, still speaking about Christ, it says, And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Iron symbolizes civil authority. Revelation 19, 50, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. There's the testimony of three that iron represents civil authority, statecraft. Isaiah 64, 8, But now, O Lord, Thou art our Father, we are the clay, and Thou our potter, and we are all the work of Thy hand. We are the clay. God is the Father. The clay is symbolizing our relationship, our religious relationship to the heavenly potter. Jeremiah 18, 6. O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand, O house of Israel. God is the potter. We are the clay. Romans 9, 20 and 21. Nay, but O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay? 
of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor. Three texts that show that man's relationship to God is symbolized as potter and clay. Clay represents churchcraft. You don't need the spirit of prophecy to define that the iron and clay in Daniel chapter 2 is identifying the combination of church and state and it doesn't cleave together because when modern Babylon is setting up its kingdom here at the end, when the threefold union comes to an end, if you want to know what happens to it, then you use the rule of first and last. And the rule of first and last we've mentioned before in here, the first time something is addressed in the Bible, the whole story is set forth there. The rest of the Bible builds on that story. The second most important time a theme is addressed in the Bible is the last. It's the rule of the first and the last. If you have Louis Weir's writings, he can, he can lay this out really well for you, very clearly. And the first story of Babylon tells you what happens at the very end. And what happens at the very end is the same thing that happened with the Tower of Babel. And what happened? They started to build it, and confusion rained down, and it all came to an end. Modern Babylon is going to implement a threefold union, which is a combination of church and state at the end of the world. And as they're putting this together, it's not going to cleave together because the Lord is going to rain down fire and take his children home with him. After the United States speaks as a dragon in verse 11, the, 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 the Sunday law has been passed, the image of the beast has been formed in the United States, and we're suggesting that the image of the beast is the combination of church and state with the church in ascendancy. And brothers and sisters, you're familiar with the passages in the spirit of prophecy. It's the Protestants of the United States, it's the Christian coalition, it's the Jerry Falwell that are getting their influence accomplished through men like George Bush and the, the men in Congress that are there by the efforts of the Christian coalition. And as Ron said the other night when he was tracking some of that history, the Christian coalition took control of Congress in 1995 and they have increased in their power at every election since then, including the one that took place a couple weeks ago. They've never remained static. They're just getting stronger and stronger. And when they took control in 1995, if you would take the men in Congress that were put there by the efforts of the Christian coalition, and if you would bring them together with the Catholics in Congress, in 1995, they already had the numbers to pass any law that they wanted to, including overriding a presidential veto. It's already in place and has been for almost 10 years. Verse 12, And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on earth in sight of men. And he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. Now, brothers and sisters, this passage here that is in the red is identifying what goes on in the United States immediately after they speak as a dragon. Immediately after they've, the formation of the image of the beast in the United States has reached maturity. Immediately after they implement the Sunday law that forces us to observe Sunday and persecutes us for keeping Sabbath. If you remember way back when, when we went through the purification of God's church, when that happens, this nation fully disconnects itself from righteousness and Satan appears on the scene. And this here is um, describing, and he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down out of heaven. Sister White says Satan appears and calls fire down out of heaven. Now, to me, there's primary and secondary definitions. I think there's a way to, ways to understand that the United States, it also calls fire down out of heaven. But what I want to point out here is the deception starts here. And this phraseology about calling fire down out of heaven is the, the historical reference that lets us say that this deceiving power is none other than the priest of Baal in the story of Elijah. And it's Salome in the story of John the Baptist. It's the power that does the dance of deception. And what de how, when it deceives them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles, which it had power to do inside of the beast, what is the purpose 
of that deception. What does it tell planet Earth to do? It tells them that they need to make an image of the beast. And what's the image of the beast? The image of the beast is defined only one way in inspiration. It's the combination of church and state with the church in the ascendancy. Now, brothers and sisters, the image of the beast has already been formed in the United States by this time. When they formed the image of the beast is when they disconnected from righteousness. This is the time period when Satan's here. They've already disconnected from righteousness. This is after the image of the beast is formed in the United States. Here they're commanding the entire world to set up an image of the beast. They're saying to the world, their deception is forcing the world to set up a combination of church and state with the church in ascendancy. And there is no other definition that you're going to find in inspiration. It's the combination of church and state with the church in ascendancy. If you doubt that, let's read on. And he, this is verse 15, the United States had power. What kind of power does the United States here have at this point? Military power and economic power. He, the United States, had power to give life unto the image of the beast. What image of the beast? The one that it commanded the world to set up. The world combination of church and state. The world image of the beast. That the, imi the, that the world image of the beast should both speak... What does it mean for a power to speak in Bible prophecy? It's an action of the legislative and judicial authorities. This world image of the beast is going to speak. By definition, it demands that whatever this civil power is that encompasses the whole world, it needs a legislative and judicial apparatus. By definition, does the United Nations have a legislative and judicial apparatus? They do. they do. Do they have an executive? Not really. It's a socialistic structure. They have a little pollet bureau that they call the, the General Security Council, but it's basically a legislative and judicial body. It's going to speak in his cause. And cause is not just going to speak, but it's going to cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. How can the United Nations cause anything to happen? Have you seen the United Nations? How many sanctions? How many sanctions did the United Nations put on Iraq? I mean, can you count that high? They didn't cause anything to happen. How are they going to cause these things to happen? Because civil power, if it's going to cause something to happen, it has to have the military or police force connected with it to make it happen. So here, if we're going to read prophecy correctly, who is it that is in alignment with the civil power that's putting the muscle into their legislation? It's the false prophet that is exercising the power in this arrangement. saying to them that dwell on earth, they should make the image of the beast, is worldwide. The so-called Christian world is the theater of great and decisive action. Men in authority will enact laws controlling the conscience after the example of the papacy. We're talking about authority here. Authority is the, the civil power, is what was, sim, what was in 533, up here in 533, when Justinian gave, identified the Pope of Rome as the head of the churches and the corrector of heretics, he turned his civil power over to the papacy. Why? Because at that point, the Pope of Rome could turn around to Justinian and say, you're a heretic, off with your head. That's the, the truth of the matter. He turned that ability over to the papacy in 533. The authority is the civil authority. The power is what enforces the civil decision-making. The seat is the person that is guiding the direction of what laws are passed and enforced. But it says, men in authority will enact laws controlling the conscience after the example of the papacy. Babylon made all nations drink 
of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Every nation will be involved. There's going to be an authority exerted over every nation in the world. That's what Bible prophecy teaches. And I know there's some books out there. A good friend of mine was recommending me one of those books here recently that take up identifying things like the the work of the Jesuits and their connection with the, the, the governments of the world and how they're pulling all the strings. And I've read through those books because many people have asked me to read through those couple of books. And I want to say here, without naming the books, brothers and sisters, at this time in Earth's history, that kind of message is not supposed to be what we're dealing with. If you've tried to promote the message of Daniel 11, 40 to 45, within your church family, then you've probably seen that you kind of reached some resistance in trying to share the very message of the hour. We don't need to complicate the message by start pointing out who it is in the world that is and isn't a Jesuit or who it is that is being controlled by Jesuits. That's not our message. And... In Testimonies, volume 6, page 395, it says, The lest we make direct charges against authorities and powers, the greater work we shall be able to accomplish, both, America, both in America and in foreign countries. Foreign nations will follow the example of the United States, though she leads out, yet the same crisis will come upon our people in all parts of the world. Brothers and sisters, we're to be wise as serpents, gentle as dove. Amen. The... the this whole world is being controlled by Satan from behind the scenes. It isn't going to gain us any ground to start identifying who's the, the front man for him in this organization or that organization. We have the everlasting gospel to carry to the world. First, the United States sets up an image of the beast and passes a Sunday law. Then the United States uses its military and economic power to force the whole world to do the same. Brothers and sisters, you can see those echoes. I know an echo comes after. I'm, I'm saying, I don't know what you'd call it if an, an echo arriving before the sound, but you can see those echoes already. The United States is over there in Iraq. George Bush says, I'm going in Iraq whether the United Nations comes with me or not. Now that he's over there, he's saying, you know, what can I do to get some United Nations people over here? They're the ones that are the peacekeepers. I want to get some of my troops out of Iraq because I need to go into Iran and I need to go into Korea. You know, he's, he's got things to do in this world, and he doesn't have enough troops. He's already um, coming into the position where he's letting everyone know that he, the United Nations has a role to play. He can clean up the messes I make as I go around the world and start forcing people to do as I say. Because remember, what did he say? You're either for us or against us. And I know that we all have our own opinions of George Bush, but for me, so far, I've watched. I've watched. And this is one of the things that some people... I think really appreciate about George Bush. He keeps his word. He keeps his word. Unlike other politicians in the recent past. Um, Daniel Revelation. First the United States. Revelation 13, 11. Then the entire world. Revelation 13, verses 14 and 15. Please notice this. If there's, a, if there's an argument about a passage in Daniel or a passage in Revelation on whether it's true or not, one of the arguments should be is the line of prophecy either in Daniel or Revelation, does it agree with the line of prophecy in the other book? And brothers and sisters, Revelation 13 teaches first the United States, then the entire world. Daniel 11 teaches First, the United States, the glorious land, then the entire world, Egypt. Revelation is a sealed book, but is also an open book. It records marvelous events that are to take place in the last days of this earth's history. The teachings of this book are definite, not mystical or unintelligible. In it, the same line of prophecy is taken up as in Daniel. Some prophecies God has repeated, thus showing that importance must be given to them. The Lord does not repeat things that are of no great consequence. So what am I saying? I'm saying that what we've done here is we've picked up some of the characteristics of the papacy in the first 10 verses 
of Revelation 13 that we wanted to establish for when we go into Revelation 17. We want to identify the papacy in Revelation 17, and uh, so we identified those. But then when we came to the United States in the image of the beast, we're establishing that first the United States passes a Sunday law and sets up an image of the beast, and then it begins to fulfill its role as the false prophet of Bible prophecy in, in practice. I mean, I believe it began to fulfill its role as the false prophet of Bible prophecy in the Reagan years, but here is where it's fully disconnected from righteousness, which in my mind means it's fully in the hands of Satan, and it goes out to the world and uses its power, economic and military, to force the world to set up a one-world government that is made up of the combination of church and state with the church in control. And I would add to this that the reason for this is illustrated in Daniel 11. Because Daniel 11, verses uh, 43 and 44, describe this very time period when the United States is forcing the world to set up uh, a one-world government, and it uses the illustration of Egypt as an example that Egypt, in verse 43, gives its gold and silver and precious things unto the papacy. And when was it that Egypt was willing to give up its wealth? It was during the plagues that were being poured out. At this time in Earth's history of Revelation 13, when the United States is forcing the world to set up an image of the beast, the judgments of God are going to be in the land because national apostasy is followed by national ruin and radical Islam is going to be about its business as of fulfilling its role as the third woe. The world is just about to be brought to its knees by the third woe. Shall we pray? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your prophetic word, and we ask that you'd use this word to finish the work which you've begun in us. Uh, we want to be among that number that gives this final warning message. We want to have a clear and united message at this hour in earth's history. We ask that you'd go before us and uh, tear down the walls that we can walk through and um, share this message, share your character with those that want to receive the light and that you would not let us be discouraged by those that are going to call the light darkness. We thank you for the time you spent with us through this week that's coming to its close, but uh, we praise you that um, we're ending it with the Sabbath and that we can really expect a, a blessing here. In a very short period of time, we ask that you would prepare things that this uh, Sabbath that's about to take place would be a high Sabbath. And we thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.